a major obstacle in your financial life? Then tune in and let's escape student loan debt. Hello, my name is Brenton Harrison, founder of Escape Student Loan Debt, and I want to welcome you to the second part in our series on the history of the student loan crisis. If you were with us in part one, we covered how almost from the beginning, the Treasury Department, in an effort to make it look like we are not spending as much on education as we actually are, started bringing other parties into this process and making the length, the distance, the layers between the funding source of the federal government and the end user, the student who's looking for a student loan, as big as possible. We did all that building up to the year 1972, and I told you that 1972 was the year that our favorite lender, Sally May, was created. And if you remember in 1965, we saw the creation of the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, where the government provided back-end support to the United Student Aid Fund, which provided back-end support to banks, who then gave money to lenders. The same was true of Sally May. It was not originally intended to be a direct-to-consumer relationship. As a matter of fact, Sally May made money in two different ways that in both cases incentivized banks to give more student loans to borrowers. The first is that they would buy loans that had already been issued by other banks so that it would take those loans off of the books of the bank. And when they did that, it would free up those banks to go and give more student loans. And the other way would be that they would lend money to the banks directly so that they could also make additional student loans. Now, the hilariously sad part about this is that in many cases, when you borrow money from somebody or an entity, you have to put up something as collateral. The same can be true when a bank borrows money from another entity, but in the case of Sally Mae, the collateral that they would accept from a bank so that they could then go turn around and give more money to students as student loans was actually other student loans. You heard that right. A bank would bring a student loan as collateral to Sally Mae so that they could get approval to get money to go give another student loan to someone else. If this sounds like a sweet deal for the banks, it was an even sweeter deal for Congress because by creating Sally Mae, which was technically a public entity but was not directly a government organization, it allowed Sally Mae to essentially obscure the accounting and numbers that were involved in this process without being forced to report them in the way that they would if they were an actual direct government entity. So if you're following along with us so far, you have the government, which is lending money to Sally May. Sally May is either lending money to banks or buying student loans off of the books of those banks. So that bank can turn around and give more and more federally backed student loans to potential borrowers. You're listening to the Escape Student Loan Debt Podcast. Subscribe now at EscapeStudentLoanDebt.com. Welcome back. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about in its early years, how the government would lend money to Sally Mae, which would then supply financing to banks who would turn around and give that money to students in the form of student loans. But in 1973, Sally Mae was displeased with the amount of money that they were getting in this arrangement because they were still having to borrow money from the government to turn around and give support to these banks. One of the ways that the government evolved and ameliorated that situation was they created in 1973 the Federal Financing Bank. And this bank was created specifically to lend money to Sally Mae at bargain rates. And now, just so you can keep track, we have the government, which sends money to the Federal Financing Bank, which loans money to Sally Mae at bargain rates, who then turns around and supports banks in their efforts to give more student loans to students. Now, keep in mind, it's our tax dollars that kick off this initial process to provide the government with the ability to be the funding source. But every single entity that they add into the equation, like Sally Mae and these banks, expects to have a profit. And the cost that they incur to help make sure that these entities have a profit is going to be passed on to you. And if that's not enough to get your blood boiling in 1979, things get even worse. We talked about how in its infancy, Sally Mae was making money in two different ways. One of those ways would be giving money directly to a bank. They would lend money to a bank and get a certain return in doing so. But the first way that we discussed would be them actually going to a bank and buying the loans off of the books of that bank 
to free up their ability to offer more loans. In 1979, a problem was occurring that it was costing Sally Mae more money to borrow than they were actually getting in return on those interest payments. And they were, again, displeased. So what the government did in 1979 to appease them is they told Sally Mae, if you keep buying these loans from these private banks so that those banks will continue to give student loans to the end user, we will guarantee you 3.5% profit on any of the loans that you buy from these banks. So as a result, Sally Mae is now in a position where they have a guaranteed profit of a minimum 3.5% on any loan that they buy from another bank. And what they do in return is they go and buy as many loans from banks as they possibly can. And by clearing these banks' books, those banks turn around and give as many loans to students as they possibly can. Now, hopefully we're getting to the point where you're looking and you're saying, you know what, this sounds a little ridiculous. And if that is the case, you are not the only one because the further remove we got from 1979, people in Congress also started to say, you know what, this is getting a little ridiculous. We have this shadow organization. Nobody knows exactly how much they're making because they're not required to report exactly how much they're making. And after a series of bank failures and economic downturns in the general economy, people in Congress started asking more specific, more pointed questions about the true cost of the student loan crisis. So what was the result of all these specific, direct, pointed questions? Well, in 1990, the Federal Credit Reform Act was passed which required Congress to project the potential losses and the potential revenues from offering student loans. And what they found was at that point in time, there was about $2 billion per year, this is 1990 dollars, that was going from the government directly to Sally Mae. We are now in the year 1992, and 1992 sees the creation of the direct loan program. And if you are my age or younger, direct loans are probably your only association with federal student loans. Because in this scenario, the government gives money directly from the Department of Education to the borrower who is in search of furthering their education. But in doing so, they are threatening Sally May's very existence by taking them out of the equation. And as you can expect, Sally May has a response. From the years 1992 to 1996, through the lobbying and internal debates about how to combat this threat of direct loans, in the year 1996, they have a sliver of opportunity that opens when Congress enacts a law that formally makes Sally May a private entity. You would think that by severing this tie and making them a formal private entity, that it would hurt Sally May. But in actuality, what it did was it freed them up to do something they hadn't been able to do in the past offer private student loans directly to students. So Sally Mae takes off on two different fronts. The first is they start offering private student loans at sky high interest rates. At their peak, some of these interest rates reach almost 30% in interest. And many of them were being given to students who were pursuing education at trade schools or for-profit schools like ITT Tech, which in later years would be proven to have misled and defrauded their students. So you have a person who's taking out a student loan, they're paying 25, 26, 28% interest to get an education at a school that does not prepare them to make an income where they'll be able to repay that student loan. The second front was to go to schools directly and encourage and incentivize that school and its loan counselors to push FFEL Stafford loans, which still included Sally Mae in the process, rather than pushing the students toward direct loans, which came directly from the Department of Education. How do you incentivize them? One way is to just lower the interest rate on these loans in the first place. See, through this old program, they still have guaranteed profits that are so profitable that they could afford to lower the interest rates below what a student could get by taking out a direct loan. And how would you incentivize the school and the loan counselor? You might tell that school's president, based on how many FFEL loans your students sign up for and your loan counselors secure, we're going to upgrade this whole computer lab to make it easier for you guys to do your job. Or you might say, based on the number of Stafford loans that your students secure at this institution, we're going to take you on an all expenses paid golf trip just to show you how much we appreciate you. This is the battle that's going on behind the scenes, all in the name of higher education. This strategy worked for Sally May for a number of years. As a matter of fact, after the creation of direct loans, Sally May, which by this point was selling stock to the public, 
actually increased exponentially in value as they secured more and more schools that were willing to push students to these private and Stafford loans instead of direct loans. But as is the case with most greedy entities, at the end of the day, Sally Mae's greed got the best of them. See, with the federally backed loans that Sally Mae was offering through the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, if a borrower defaulted on that loan, Sally Mae was covered and protected by the federal government. But with a private student loan, if a borrower defaulted on that loan, that loss would have to be eaten by Sally Mae and its shareholders. And as the years progressed and they pushed more and more private loans on students who were going to for-profit schools or non-profit schools who just ended up not being able to repay, a bigger and bigger portion of Sally Mae's books ended up being loans that would end up in default. As a matter of fact, people who owed private student loan debt to Sally Mae started filing bankruptcy, specifically hoping to get away from this debt. And in response, Sally Mae supported legislation that in 2005 resulted in private student loans being added to the undue hardship test in bankruptcy proceedings. However, it was too late for Sally Mae to turn the tides and change their fortune. Borrowers increasingly moved towards direct loans rather than the guaranteed loans that would involve Sally Mae in the process and guarantee their profits. And the private loans that they had banked so much of their hopes on had reached the point where just an unsustainable amount of the loans that they had extended ended up in default status. And by 2008, at the height of the financial crisis, Sally Mae gave up the ghost. And this entity, this public-private partnership that Congress helped create so that they could obscure the cost of the money that was going towards education, ended up being the first recipient of a federal bailout.